Today's interview is with my good friend, Jason Hitchcock. He and I have known each other for a long time back when he used to work on fandom communities with a company called Bebo that was acquired by Twitch. Uh, So largely in the gaming space, he would think about how are they building and growing fandoms through the product. And that ultimately led him into the world of crypto, where he started thinking about investing and becoming financially independent. He now is the GP of his fund called Four Moons, where they're investing in DeFi and different crypto protocols. And Jason was a person that was a landing pad for me in the world of Web3 and crypto. When I was just wanting to learn more about how to get more engaged in that ecosystem and get more skin in the game. Uh, He held my hand through setting up my first wallet and just he has a way of explaining these concepts in a way that make you understand it and understand the applications and opportunities and dynamics in it. And that's what we talk about on this interview. We try to talk through crypto, talk through Web3, talk through DeFi, decentralized finance in a way that hopefully helps you understand why it's exciting, what the dynamics of it are, how it works, and how you might be able to get more involved. Because if you are curious about community in Web3, I think it's really hard to really wrap your head around it until you are invested in it, until you experience the journey of joining these communities and being an owner and participating in it. So uh, we talk all about that. We talk about DeFi, what it is, how it works, And we also talk about Yieldopolis, a community that Jason started that I'm a member of specifically for a small group of people to be able to learn together, to invest together. I think there's probably about 100 members in it now. I'm not sure how many in total, but it's become this very high quality, useful space to learn about Web3, which is very different from what you usually see with Web3 on Twitter and in public spaces that can be all about hype. And uh, it can be really hard to learn. So we talk about how we built that community and how you might be able to find a community like that for yourself. We have a lot of fun in this one, riffing on community theory, community philosophy, crypto. I think you're going to learn a lot and uh, hope you enjoy it. Let's dive in. Let's kick off. Jason, welcome to the show. All right. Hey, good to be here. Hey, hi. A non-awkward podcast introduction as always. Excellent. Yeah, exactly. That was normal. Yeah, very normal. Um, Well, very happy to have you on the show. Uh, And we've known each other for a long time, back to like the Bebo days. You've kind of dabbled in the world of community through Bebo and Twitch and, you know, have have kind of seen that world. And and now you, you were kind of I, I've said recently that everyone needs someone to kind of hold their hand and walk them through crypto to really get it. Mm-hmm. Like it's really hard to learn until someone on the inside just like grabs your hand and like helps you set up a wallet and just talks you through it mm-hmm. and it helps you get everything set up. And and you were that person for me, which I'm very, very grateful for. You just right. took the time and we just chatted one-on-one for like an hour and you walked me through the concepts and helped me get set up. And, and, uh, and you also invited me to Yieldopolis, which we're going to talk about your community that you started, which is helping people get into crypto and, and DeFi. Mm-hmm. So I asked you on the show because I thought it'd be really cool to see if we can kind of provide a similar kind of experience the way you provided for me, uh, for the listeners of the show to understand a little bit more about crypto and DeFi, mm. um, hear more about how you, you know, what you've been learning and how you've been building Yieldopolis and, and talk about like DeFi in general, because it's such an interesting new concept that has community dynamics, and I'm still wrapping my head around it. So Mm -hmm. I'm excited to ask you lots of questions about it. Great. These are my favorite topics. Awesome. Well, let's go. Let's go into it. Uh, Maybe we'll just start. Could you just share a little bit about your background with Bebo, with Twitch, and how you came to the world of DeFi? Absolutely. So I spent like the last 10 years working at early stage startups. You know, I I built out sales teams at like a mobile ad network in the gaming space, installing banner ads and all your favorite apps. Um, You know, that was, I was trying to figure out where I was going to work in tech because I didn't want to code or do design, but I liked the internet. And so I thought, go to market, you know, getting people excited about tech. And so sales, BD, I led a customer success team at an early stage startup. Um, I then joined Monkey Inferno, where I worked with Sean Purry and Furcon and Tyler Mm -hmm. and all those guys. And we made tons of apps, including Blab, which I think like a bunch of us used. Um, 
similar to Clubhouse, but with video, got millions of users. And then we started making apps for teens. We made some FaceTime apps. We made a streaming app for content creators that Twitch ended up acquiring. Um, and then while I was at Twitch, I led, I made up and I created a team called Fandom Strategy. And it was focused on evaluating, you know, are we doing the things we need to do to make fandom stronger or are we squashing fandom? And I got really interested in that. And then while I was at Twitch, by around year two, I started to get obsessed with DeFi and earning passive income. I didn't want to work at a big company anymore. I was kind of getting bored of the internet and was kind of getting worried about like, oh, like I've been working on the internet for 10 years. I actually don't, I haven't really fully enjoyed all the roles that I've really done, even though I did fine at them. Uh, what do I do? And I started working on like, I started making chat rooms with friends to try to make passive income. And we would talk about Shopify stores this and premium newsletters that and like, oh my God, looks like you can go buy this company on some marketplace for like not that much money and we can flip it and fix it up and blah, blah, blah. Nothing worked. And um, until um, uh, my my mentor, I guess, Boz, my friend, he's like, he was mm-hmm. working in crypto and he asked me about Hey, Jason, you have some Ethereum from like the last cycle. Like, what are you doing with it? Are you earning interest with it? And I just, I was like, what's interest? Um, what's yield? What do you mean? What am I doing with it? And he showed me then all these little things you can do with Ethereum that can help you earn passive income. And then next thing you know, I went and I just, I started really going and playing around in DeFi and earning a lot of interest. And then I went and just kind of like liquidated all my assets and put them into crypto to like really explode that. And then soon after that, I would, I would scream to people in like these group chats all turned into crypto chats. And I was yeah. explaining to everyone I know, Hey, like you got to know about DeFi, DeFi, you, you can borrow against your crypto. You can then lend out that money and earn interest and blah, blah, blah. And I was showing everyone how I would do it. And a bunch of my friends were like, Oh my God, that's crazy. And they would start doing it too. And we ended up just having lots of conversations about crypto going um, and quickly raised a fund because a bunch of people were like, could you invest for me? Then that fund after like five months, it, w- it was up a lot. And then it got acquired by a hedge fund. And so now we like within a span of 18 months, like it was like, what do I do? I don't really like working at Twitch uh, to like learning DeFi to like now it's like we have like a hundred million dollar fund and we're managing like the portfolio of this hedge fund that's just raising a ton of money. It's It's been a, a wild journey. Along the way, though, um, I've been in like, I've created these different group chat communities that where allies come together and like create war rooms around like crypto and like how we can all earn as much money as possible. And that, I think that was a key to making it. I think a key to everything was like the war room. Um, it becomes your home base. And is that what became Yieldopolis? Actually, how did Yieldopolis start? Yieldopolis started because there were like five or six of these group chats and there were three or four people in all of them. And I was getting so many people were asking me crypto tips and like, hey, how do I do this? And like, hey, what do you think? What, what are you investing in now? And what have you done? What, what moves have you made lately? And I was tired of chatting them to all these people. And especially since some of these people were in some of these chats. And I just said, you know... I'm going to declare bank. Like I am no longer participating in these five chats. I am going to make this other one. I'm inviting all of you and I'm adding other people to it who are hitting me up. And I like, I need to do this for my sanity, create like Mm -hmm. a consolidated group chat. And the only people I'm inviting though, are the people that I like. Uh, Like I only want people who are hungry in these things. I don't want, I don't know if you're, if, if you weren't obviously hungry to learn and participate, like you didn't, you weren't on my radar, even if you were in some of these group chats with me. And so I wanted to have a high signal group of people that wanted to, that all wanted to have the same goals. And so like by having the same goals, it's like we all had the same energy in the group chat. People were, hey, I just learned this uh, post. Hey, uh, screenshot, like I just made this move. Here's the amount of money I spent. Here's the amount of money I earned on the other side. And we created a culture of talking about transparently the money you're moving around. How much? What did it do? So that we could all copy each other's homework. And so you have to be a particular type of person to even be comfortable doing that. And then as we met more people along the way, someone would be like, hey, I met someone that works for Olympus Dow, or I met someone who's they're, you know, a GP at A16Z. And like they would just, next thing you know, 
the community grew as people would refer in like, hey, I know someone who's kind of like us. Uh, they're so right. bright and connected and like they're they're in the game. Um, yeah, and that's what it is today. Today, it's like I'm really proud of it. It's it's not a consumer brand. I don't invite people to it. <laughs> I um, it's I the only I'm the only person that can let people in and I only let people in when I bump into them and I'm really impressed with them now. Um, I don't really want to let people in who are just trying to learn. Um, that's not what the community's in. It, like the community's evolved as everyone is sort of leveled up too. It's like, right. Yeah. Like that new to crypto I know. that we have is like way more advanced now. I know. I was thinking about that. Like recently I'm like the new to crypto stuff. I'm like, this isn't new at all. <laughs> this is pretty advanced stuff. But well, you're able to keep up with um, it. I, I try to. I'm, to be honest, I do not keep up with it as much as I wish I could. Y'all are a lot smarter than me when it comes to this stuff. Um, but uh, I think there's a couple interesting dynamics there to call out. One is, I like how you you basically just had this network that you were the node of, and but they're all kind of disparate conversations and chats. And then you brought that together into a community and I actually think that's how most really, really good, strong founding communities start is like there's someone or a small group that's a node that all these other people are connected to. So there's already the conversations happening. They're just not talking to each other yet. And it almost happens, it happens so organically when you create that shared space that, you know, it's it's basically like, well, we already have the engagement, just we haven't given them a space to talk to each other yet. And that's what you did with Yieldopolis. And I mean, there's not a ton of people in there, but it's very active and and like high quality, high signal content there all the time. That's a really good point. And I uh, I think there's sort of like a familiarity where everyone knows they kind of knows they sort of know each other from like through me. And some of them are like, I've mm. met before. Um, I've also been told by a lot of people they appreciate that it's not a bunch of internet anons. It's everyone uses their real name in there. Um, Mm -hmm. And because I sp I onboard everyone, I I have spoken mm -hmm. to everyone in that group about this group and explained the expectations about it as I as I let them in, and so um, it doesn't that's not typical for a Discord, and so people are like oh these are like real people it's not like the internet these are people Jason knows he's described this as his network so like. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, there's really nothing inappropriate in there. People don't really go that off topic. People are pretty serious. I think people feel honored to be in there, I think. And then like, because like, it's so well curated, and I make everyone post an introduction. The introductions are all mm -hmm. amazing. Everyone has, like, yeah, a really thorough. Well, there's like five people from the White House in here. Like, it's just so people try to like, I think, live up to the conversation they expect in there, which is pretty cool. I also totally. think one you reason why it's also successful is it always was self-serving for me as like, I need this to be useful for me. 100%. By yeah. making it useful to me, it and I didn't realize this, this is like an after the fact realization, it was useful yeah. to everybody. And a lot of people came to me and they were like, oh my gosh, this is useful for, for all these reasons that I thought were just unique to me. Um, mm hmm 100%. Yeah, I see that all the time in communities. Uh, it's another thing that you consistently see is the ones that are successful are where the founders are solving their own problem. Like they need the community because that's what makes you want to spend so much time in there. And because you're the leader and you're like, building the energy of the community and putting it in, that's what makes everyone else want to put that energy in as well. I also think a lot of people are seeking out this kind of conversation and they don't know where to go. And they see it on Twitter and it's random, it's posts, it's synchronous. They go to, people say, and I say this, go to a project's Discord, but you go in there and it's like a bunch of anime avatars. Chaos. Who are these people? Yeah. And then, and so the idea that you're like, oh, these are people who typically show up and they're all friends and they're all smart. That guy's from Goldman, he's a financial analyst. This person's like a founder of like some crypto project, like, Right. These are all bright people. These are all early crypto investors. And they're just, this is what they have to say. And this is what they care about. Interesting. Totally. Yeah. I mean, that was the other thing I was going to call out that I think is interesting. Most of the people who are listening to this, I imagine, are very new to crypto or haven't really dipped their toes in a lot and um, probably have a lot of mixed connotations and perceptions of it as well. Um, but like, there are a lot of groups like this, but they're for the most part similar in that they're like private and curated 
and you kind of already have to have access to someone like I got I, I guess I'm just lucky that I already knew you and and you invited me um, but if like I didn't have that I don't there aren't a lot of other networks that I would have access to so for the people who are like wanting to learn and get more into crypto it's you, their perception of it as what they see on Twitter and as what they see in these really large discords, there's this whole like more private, more curated, small group underlayer that they're not seeing. And that's actually where a lot of people are learning and collaborating and coordinating how they get more involved and how they invest in crypto. Yeah, I would say the public discourse on crypto is not does not look like very much like this, I guess, discourse. Like this is more I don't know. At least when I'm, I'm referring to like DeFi and like NFT investing, it's just, I think there's just a more nuanced, practical, realistic conversation. Uh, it doesn't feel like hype. So, but I yeah, also exactly. think it also took, <laughs> it's so much hype online. It took like a year and a half space. to build like um, one person at a time, talking to tons of people, casting a wide net, and inviting people into. A chat room that became and like having it be useful for everybody. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I'm I'm curious. Do you have advice for people who don't have a network like I Yieldopolis? Think, I think you right have now to start to by find something it. like it. I think you have to create it, and it starts with you and you know four uh, mm. three other friends who are allies. And by allies, I mean like they share your goals like your crypto investing goals, you all are pursuing similar things so that like you all have the same filter for looking at the world and the stuff that people bring into the conversation is all on topic. If you don't, mm -hmm. then it's like, you're talking about like, hey, check out this cool artist for this NFT. And I'm like, check out this new protocol launching that has a high APY. Like, I don't, I don't give it, I don't care what, like what, who cares if they're a cool artists? Like, how is that going to make me money? And you're just like, what does that have to do with art? And yeah. <laughs> and, or just like, wow, check out this metaverse thing that's coming out. It's like, okay, who cares? Like, yeah. like in, it all needs to align with our agenda so that when I'm like, I have an opportunity, everyone goes, oh shoot, I'm going to pay attention. What's the opportunity? Right. It's right. Thing we're all and, and that. And that agenda can start off broadly, right? Like if you're new to this, you may not know exactly what your most, you know, what what the right paths are for you yet, but find other people who are in that similar space and stage. Um, and I will say, I think it's interesting as well in this conversation because, um, you know, you brought me into the world of crypto and understanding how to invest. And I also have this other layer that I think a lot of people listening to this episode will relate to of I'm very interested in crypto from a community standpoint. Uh, what are the new dynamics of how businesses are being built and how communities are being built? And community is obviously this like very hot topic in the world of crypto. And I guess like what I'm kind of thinking about as we're talking is for someone who wants to learn more about the dynamics of community in crypto, potentially work as a community manager in crypto, um, to to engage more deeply in the space, how important is it for them to also be an investor in the space? How is um how important is it to understand community to be an investor? Yeah, like I'm even thinking about it from my perspective. I like I guess my point is it's kind of important because it was really hard for me to wrap my head around a lot of the community dynamics until I had skin in the game and I was investing and owning yeah. and starting to learn the dynamics of these systems. I think, I mean, that a few thoughts come to mind. Like one, I don't think you can understand communities without being a stakeholder yourself and then feeling all the feelings and like, or like being able to empathize with the different feelings that stakeholders might have as you look at a product. Like crypto has a new property, which is like tokens. And so, and protocols. Mm -hmm. One thing that's interesting about protocols is they're so open. And so they're, you know, protocols are, they, they, many of them are open source or community, community built and community owned. And so your ability to, they have all sorts of ways for you to be a stakeholder. Um, one way to be a stakeholder is simply you buy the token. You were early, you get credit for being right. And you can tell other people about this protocol 
And if they buy it, your token price should go up. Like that's what you can do for the protocol. Other people might be users. They might be liquidity providers on an exchange. They might be traders who use the exchange. Um, they, they may want to see features uh, get better. And they're like, hey, I'm going to talk about my user experience and I hope someone listens. Or I'm going to write about it and put a proposal to improve it. I'm going to think about it. Um, and I'm going to rally people to vote for my thing. Or I can code. I'm going to join. I'm going to actually build something for this thing. And or I'm going to I'm going to take my sto- my tokens and I'm going to stake them in the DAO. I'm going to take them out of circulation. You welcome everybody. And now I'm going to be a part of the DAO and I'm going to collect revenue and I'm going to vote on things. And like all these things are like new ways to engage with a company and they all sort of get rewarded with more tokens and effectively like tokens kind of deputize users to improve the protocol in every way. You are deputized mm-hmm. to evangelize to improve the product. And then what ends up happening is to discuss, what ends up happening is like people are showing up for this product in the same way that like I have feelings about my coworkers at Twitch and other startups. And I've got feelings about teammates I've had that like on sports teams, like we were there. Uh, We were talking all the time. Like there you are. Like I know you. And like you see familiar faces in the protocol. You end up becoming proud and like, It's weird. Like I have all these feelings of feeling proud of niche financial software I've used because I've been like been in the community, and I those are new. Those are new feelings, and so you can't talk about this stuff or build this stuff credibly. I think without feeling those feelings, Um, Mm. and those are all strong. Those are those are like new superpowers that a company has, but they're also their community dynamics. Um, To me, that's the most fascinating thing about Web three companies is like how protocols deputize their users with tokens. Yeah. It's kind of like merging all these identities that we've seen in Web2 of the employee, like you feel like your colleagues in a way on a team of evangelizers, like being an early adopter of a new product, you're also that. Um, A lot of the time, that's the interesting thing in Web3 is in most of these communities, you are both the employee and the consumer. Uh, which is something that's really unique from Web two, and and so just like having those experiences, I gr- I agree. Like until you are invested and you're experiencing those things, it's really hard to understand how to build them, and and what those dynamics are. Um, I want to go into DeFi and explain some of the things that you just described as well. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe like let's just start from. 101 level, you know, when you walked me through it, basically I was in the stage where I owned a bunch of Bitcoin and Ethereum on Coinbase. Um, that's kind of like an easy step one for people, like buy some Ethereum, buy some Bitcoin on something like Coinbase, an exchange that makes it easy to just own it. That's kind of like step one. But where you took me to was now creating my own wallet was like one really critical point. And using exchanges to transfer those coins to that wallet. And once it's in that wallet, now you can start using it for all of these other things. And you can invest in DeFi and yeah. other apps and other programs. Is that, is that kind of like the right trajectory for someone who's trying to dip their toes in? That's the trajectory for sure. Uh, that's how, like, that is the trajectory to take custody of your tokens. And you're essentially loading up your wallet is kind of like a profile. And so you're basically saying, I have like this Coinbase profile that has my tokens and my Coinbase profile can't really do anything, but I'm going to load it to this other profile that Mm -hmm. I can use MetaMask with and I can go around the internet and log into stuff with that wallet and I can start doing things. And MetaMask is a wallet, just to clarify. The way I would think about this is, you know, if all all crypto is to you is tokens and numbers go up and down, uh, just know... Think about Bitcoin as like a very special computer. It's a new kind of computer. It's a decentralized computer. There's thousands of computers that are all kind of connected that are all maintaining one sort of instance of, of, an, of, of, of an operating system. And that operating system runs one app and it's called Bitcoin. And you can send money around. Not, you know, it's only not terribly useful. Um, right. What Vitalik then did was he took the same thing made Ethereum. The thing that's different about Ethereum is that there's a programming language as well. And so 
Now you can make apps. There's more apps that can be made on this operating system. And those are apps where you can spend the token, you know, in this case, Ethereum, not Bitcoin. So the more apps that you have where you, Ethereum is useful, the more valuable Ethereum is. Like, look at this great app. I need Ethereum for it. And so now we're seeing thousands of apps coming out on Ethereum that all use it. And it's very, they're all very interesting. So that's like step one. Step two, DeFi. DeFi is short for decentralized finance. And there's a whole, you know, one of the big things that everyone does in crypto is they try to say, how do I recreate this, this industry on the blockchain? It's a riddle because they're trying to make a decentralized version of it. They're using this blockchain software, which has new properties. And so the way to recreate the same kind of service is a little bit different. It's like solving a riddle. And so decentralized finance apps are all apps that are financial that basically just uh, uh, they they're just running on the blockchain. And one thing that many of these apps have in common is let me give you like a short example. If you were to make if you were to want to get a loan, you would need to go to a bank, apply for a loan, and then that bank would have to go to a bigger bank to originate the loan. And then they would down the chain, they'd give it to you and you'd have to pay it back every month. Um, in DeFi, the way loans work, they, the way it's figured out, there is no big bank to originate that loan. You go and you want to get a loan and there's just kind of like a bucket that has a bunch of money in it and you can pull, you can put up collateral like other crypto tokens and then you can pull money out of the bucket. And that bucket gets all of the money from a Wikipedia army of people that have money. Me, you, anybody else. We can all put money in the bucket instead of that big bank. And then the fees that you pay go to us instead of that big bank. And it turns out those fees are pretty large. And there's many financial products out there that need, that would normally go to a big institution like that big bank to get the capital they need to deliver the service, whether it's insurance or maybe it's an exchange and then they need a market maker to help facilitate trades. In DeFi, they've come up with a decentralized way for the crowd to kind of provide the financing for all these things. And so that's what's interesting about DeFi. And, and what's, I guess the final thing that's interesting about that is the crowd then gets paid. Um, and you can get paid interest uh, for all these things that you never uh, previously were able to sort of, you know, put your money towards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in, a, in essence, DeFi is a decent decentralized version of a bank where instead of a central entity kind of distributing and controlling those funds it's distributed to you know millions of people often who are providing those funds in exchange for the same kinds of fees that banks would usually collect so we're cutting out the bank as that middleman yeah in 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 one case yeah that's like how it would work are there other apps and things that are really useful to kind of exemplify why the blockchain is is powerful beyond just replacing banks? Um, yeah, I mean, I think like there's, there's other technologies that are interesting. Like um, we've talked about helium routers before. You know, today when you go to mm, the city, yeah. if you're riding one of those bird scooters or really if you have any Internet of Things device, they're constantly talking to cell phone towers to get all sorts of data. And, you know, cool. They get the location data or the weather data. And um, that's fine. It's just that software company has to pay that cell phone tower um, a certain rate every month for that data. And that gets passed on to the customer. And so now there's interesting products like the Helium Network where people are setting up these, met these routers in their homes. And we're seeing this massive new competing cellular network emerge and uh, they're upgrading it to 5g now and the same it, the, the difference is it's one tenth the price and so instead of the cell phone company getting paid by the way you get paid so when someone connects to your router because they need data and your router that's plugged into the internet provides the data like congrats you collect some helium tokens and those are traded on the open market so i don't know um I think there's a yeah. lot. Of, and then, you know, there's NFTs, which are really interesting. Like artists are mm -hmm. now able to publish their work onto, you know, the global store, which is the blockchain. Um, you know, so anyone can buy it 24 hours a day, the largest marketplace ever. 
And so artists and like there's there's a lot of interesting new properties that are coming into that field as well. So yeah. And I also think that remaking banks and finance is massive. It's like it, it leads to remaking of everything else. And so yeah. Totally. Yeah, the helium one's a really good one. And I remember reading about that story and how um, they tried to create incentive, like it existed before blockchain existed, and they they tried to create these incentive models and systems, but just be without the blockchain, it just didn't work. Like the incentive mechanisms and the way to manage them didn't work. And it was the blockchain that allowed massive amounts of people to essentially collaborate and contribute to the system with those routers. Um, is there, I know you and I have talked about this before. Is there any application of blockchains that you're really excited about where it has nothing to do with finance or nothing to do with money? Right. Cause yeah, like the, the router, it's like you get rewarded with money. NFTs are still money driven. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I am most interested in, I, I am not interested in finance. So I do not, I don't, I don't really like DeFi, even though that's ma- mostly what I invest in and what I make my money on. And that's interesting. Uh, but I'm interested in fandom. And so I'm, I, I want to, I'm excited to see how NFTs and smart contracts are cleverly used to facilitate fandom. Um, I believe, you know, like there's sort of three legs to the fandom chair. Um, leg one is what's the emotional range of an experience. Um, the highs are high, the lows are low, and you have, you know, good, good timing in between, um, you know, to take you on that emotional journey. That's why we want to be in a fandom Two, social connection. We want to connect with other people that share our obsession. Uh, we well, we're going to be friends with them if we meet them. And so What's the quality and variety of spaces I can meet these people? Are, are they are there real life situations? Are there digital spaces? Are there social media? Is there like a communal vibe? You know, one on one and one to many. And then finally, self identification. I want to let people know I'm a fan. I want to look in the mirror and I want to see a fan. I want to advertise to people who don't know we exist. You could be one of us too. And that could be merch. That could be, oh my God, look at that silver status. I know how hard it is to get that. Um, or you were there in 1994. Like you have tickets to that. That was a crazy night. Um, and so I think NFTs, I think can easily, like, I think it's really obvious when I say things like that, you can start to think about like, how could a brand use NFTs? Like you were there. Here you go. Like token. Uh, this token gets you access to like the social calendar that all the other super fans have access to. And like, you know, oh my God, like this might remind you of that one special time, that crazy episode when that happened, like, and everybody got one at the end of the episode. Like imagine at the end of Game of Thrones, like you had to scan. It's like the the credits are coming up. You just finished, you're there live. And they're like, this is a live mint. You have to be here right now. You have 10 seconds, scan this QR code pull your sword out of the pile and like you, you and 5 million people mint swords from game of Thrones. And like you, you look at your sword and you're like, Oh my God, it's one of the 18 Valyrian steel swords. Like you don't, you don't need to go to open sea to see like, Oh, there's only 18 of these. Like you read the books. Um, and you don't need like rarity traits. You don't care. Like you just know what it is or like it could have been a Harry Potter wand. Like you could have been reading the book, Harry Potter and while you're reading, guess what? You got sorted into Ravenclaw. And like you got a little token that was like on your first read, 1993, you're Ravenclaw. Maybe that even gets you into Ravenclaw camp. Like, and like a branch could provide that. Um, so anyway, I'm excited about brands, like or not not brands, but fandom. And I think fandom, you know, bounces across brands and IP and all sorts of things in life. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, it, ter- it turns it into fanhood as a consumption of, yeah, I got to watch that episode. I get to talk about it. But like when you actually get to own a piece of it, it just deepens that connection. And, and that doesn't have to have anything to do with finance. I, I think like part of the trouble is it's really hard to separate finance from the reputation in crypto because there's always a dollar value on that token or mm-hmm. that NFT or that thing that you have. Um, it's interesting. It's like people debate it as good and bad. 
Um, and I right. would argue it's just new. Like the financialization mm-hmm. of everything is one thing. Like, ooh, the like we're we're financializing our whole culture. Yes. And that also means aspects of our culture that are getting financialized are now actually getting the credit they deserve. And they are getting mm-hmm. the resources they need to reinvest in that culture and scale it. And it's sort of like, I feel like it's actually meeting in the middle of the way a lot of people describe it. And so it's good and bad in that it's different. And like, I think it's, yeah. Mm. There's like new yeah. aspects of our culture are getting, are, are like now have funding to perpetuate themselves. Yeah, that, that's what, what excites me about it is that it provides funding mechanisms for things that we've had a really hard time funding and proving the like financial value of in the past, community being one of them, right? Like one of the biggest complaints over the last decade from people building communities is how hard it is to monetize and prove the value of it. And this can solve for that. Now the flip side is like, yeah, now you're financializing a lot of things that were social contracts before. Um, but is it is it good or bad? Yeah, I agree. It, it's kind of hard to label it as good or bad. It's new and different. It solves some problems and it creates some new problems. Yeah. And like maybe the previous way of uh, doing things actually was inadequate. Maybe we've held back certain ideas by not valuing them properly. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we're seeing on on the art side of things, for sure, we're seeing uh, people be able to create things and support support a lifestyle of creation in a way they couldn't before. Um, I just had Austin Roby on the podcast and we talked about co-ops and this idea of the co-op essentially being like, we believe this thing should exist in society, but the biggest challenge that co-ops have is funding. Because they're not nonprofits, so they don't get grants and they're not mm. venture backed, so they can't really get investors because it's employee owned. And now DAOs are becoming this way where we can create social goods and there's a funding mechanism for that. Yeah. I mean, I look at the properties of DeFi and I see new, like, you have assets that just continuously cash flow. And so, like, you know, you look at low margin businesses that bring a lot of delight to the world, like that are high risk, like these local legend restaurants. Um, like mm-hmm. if they just had a certain amount of Ethereum and like, imagine like a local rest. I was just imagining like, there's this place in Ann Arbor. I'm from Ann Arbor, Michigan, like Blimpy Burger. If Blimpy Burger sold a commemorative <laughs> NFT just to support them, I bet they would raise thousands of ETH and then they could stake that. And they could be getting, you know, like a couple hundred ETH a year from like the staking yield. And then they could reinvest that in the Mm -hmm. business. And like, I don't even think they would know what to spend it on. It would be so much. And great. And then maybe they could get fresher ingredients or they could pay the staff more or they would just be less worried. And I think, I think we're going to see a big realignment around things that we believe in. Um, And Mm. uh, I also like... I also think like we under like things that we undervalue, like we undervalue humor, like like memes are some of like the most popular NFTs that are most valuable NFTs. Like it's constantly getting we're constantly like the crowd is saying like we think jokes are funny, we think memes are valuable, and like the establishment like refuses to take them seriously. We even have a hard time like even saying it out loud, like, ah, this is serious, but it really is what we want. And so I almost feel like the id. With it, like within the internet, yeah. like our collective id as a society yeah. is getting funded yeah, by crypto. It, That's why it feels so. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's a really good point, though. Like you could think about all. Look at what's happening during the pandemic. There's so many amazing local businesses that are going under, right? Because they they just like can't survive just based on the thin margin. And like the narrative that we've had over the last decade of the Amazons coming and destroying the mom and pops. Like there are things that we deeply love as humans that like the system we had wasn't properly supporting and funding, even though we deeply valued it, we couldn't keep it alive. And and, like, that's a problem. And if web three provides a mechanism to keep the things we love, not only alive, but like they should be thriving by creating that value and that love. I, I feel like the killer app, everyone's like, what's the killer app of crypto? We're still searching for it. But like, it's already given us one killer app and it's fundraising. And right. I also think like, 
our behavior doesn't always match our beliefs. And so it's like, I might say that Blimpy Burgers, boy, love that restaurant, best burger place in the world. I like, but I actually have no way to support them other than by eating a burger there. Right. If it like, if they did give me like a golden, you know, Blimpy Burger bear and like <laughs> that got me some perks, like it got me, yeah, like, yeah, like by buying this bear, I get a free, you know, whatever for life. Um, yeah, but in exchange, like that's worth it. Uh, I bet that I bet like a lot of people would put their money where their mouth is. Yeah, absolutely. By the way, I think you might be playing with keys or something. The sounds coming through. Oh, so. I am. I am playing with <laughs> keys. So. Not, not a good. I, I fiddle with magnets. <laughs> They're quiet. <laughs> I always have to fiddle with something. Um, but on that point, yeah. One thing I keep thinking about as well is that there's a lot. There's a ton of things. There's a ton of artists and creations and businesses and things in crypto now that I I don't know that there's anyone that I knew of before that's doing something in crypto now that I was a huge fan of. But I'm just trying to. I'm. I imagine what that's going to be like when like Bon Iver is my favorite band in the world. Like I've listened to that album. So many times I can't even count. I've I go to every single show I can. Like that Justin Vernon just like moves me and I love him and I love Bonavir. If Bonavir were to give me any opportunity to like own a piece of what they've created, it would it would be incredible. Like I would jump on that opportunity so fast. And I haven't had that opportunity yet in Web3, but that's what I think about for the people who are getting into it to support artists that they already loved, like that feeling must be incredible to be able to support them in another way other than just buying their art. Yeah, like what if I'm a huge fish fan? What if Trey Anastasio came out with an NFT collection called like the 50 Trey's 50 favorites and it's 50 guitar solos that are frozen into an NFT and each each guitar solo is matched with art of the guitar it was played on. And so now it's like, and then it comes out once a year, Trey's 50. It's like, oh crap. Like I got one, I got an, I got a 2022 Trey 50. I got guitar solos one through 10. Right. Uh, like these are sick guitar solos. He minted them. He decided I own, I don't know. Like that's like new surface area for fandom in my mind. Yeah. You know, I like, I know I have like some alpha, like I some uh I know that like Kyrie Irving right now is working on like an NFT collection mm-hmm. where you're gonna mint a you're gonna mint Kyrie's and they're gonna be awesome. And I don't know what they're gonna do, but I know that if you mint a golden Kyrie, he's the number one seller of Nike shoes of any athlete. Mm-hmm. And so I just bought some um, Kyrie's actually. <laughs> people people who own a golden Kyrie uh-huh. are gonna get access to are gonna get a free pair of his shoes like a month early when they come out. That's dope. So like yeah. yo, like what a cool way to treat your fans, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. How cool would it be if there was like a crew? Like, what if like a bunch of NBA players had that, and like a bunch of them were buddies? They are buddies, but like, what if Kyrie and his friend and he's friends with LeBron, and you know, name a few stars? Like, I collected all of them. Mm-hmm. Like, I got I got a LeBron, I got a Kyrie, I got a Steph Curry, and next thing you know, like I have the squad, and like if I completed it, then like I not only do I get like all the individual perks that they're all giving me. But like, because they're all buddies, they made a thing where like, I get like all of them. Yeah. And like I'm in some like super, I'm in like some super club of like, I don't know. That seems like a fun way to be a fan. Yeah. <laughs> and and the, like the accessibility and access thing comes to mind because it's like, okay, Kyrie launches a shoe once or Bonavera launches their NFT once. And it's like, okay, everyone buys it. And then it becomes extremely expensive. Like, does that now make me as a fan feel less connected or less access because I can't even afford to participate on an ownership level? I think, I mean, it just becomes up to the the object of fandom, I guess, you know, like how do they, how do they want to sort of, what kind of journey do they want to offer their fans so that like they have, what are like, they have a range of opportunities. Not everyone can be a part of everything. And that's right. what makes that, that's what makes certain things juicy to be a part of. Mm. And being uh, early helps then, right? Like I loved Bon Iver before they were huge. If I bought that NFT then, then I'm really feeling rewarded for being, you know, an early fan instead of just having to brag about being an early Bon Iver fan before everyone else knew them. Yeah. I mean, I almost think that like 
basically NFTs give every brand, every IP, every object of fandom, as I call them, uh, the opportunity to have like the kind of engagement relationship with your stakeholders that like a video game has with its players. Yeah, Players have a saved profile. They're accumulating items and progress in a game. They're also getting memories of how awesome this game is. And like, like that can be what it's like to be a fan. Like as a fan, like you're collecting tickets and memorabilia and stories. And like now it's like there's a whole digital interface for all of this. And so I can be giving you tokens that un- that have properties that unlock access to these things. Mm-hmm. And you collect them along the way. And like they can add up and, you know, multiply into things. And when I see David, David, oh my God, like look at how many Bonavere tokens you've got. Like, could you please tell me about some of these? I bet let's get to know each other. Like, <laughs> and yeah. you're like, oh my God, he's asking me about my Bonavere yeah. tokens. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like finally. Um, uh, love it. Okay. Last thing before we get into our rapid fire questions, I just want to like make sure we close the loop a little bit on the the DeFi side of things. So, um, I guess like, what are, are you seeing those similar kind of community dynamics in DeFi? Like are, are these social dynamics happening in DeFi or is it more of like a pure financial investment kind of thing? If someone was interested in getting more involved in DeFi. I think that these are, uh, qualities to think about. Uh, that go into like the matrix of evaluating investments. I think you look at, I think every DeFi protocol has a fandom, they have a community and you can evaluate the like, like one way to assess, like, is this a good investment? Is like, what's the vibe like in the community? Are, are like the right people talking about it? Are people excited to be in it? People memeing? Are they having fun? Are they glad to be there? Is there mm-hmm. something to look forward to? Um, if people have a question about the protocol, they seem to be able to get the answer because the protocol and the community have made tools and information available to access this stuff. Because when that exists, when you when you can ask a question and get an answer, whether someone says the answer in Discord or now there's a dashboard over here or check the GitHub or whatever, once the the more consistently questions are answered, the more questions get asked. And like the advancement of these protocols is a function of like how how much we're learning and how fast mm. we are learning together. And so you can kind of do a pulse check. Like I look at communities. I do not invest in in protocols that have dog shit communities. Um, that they need to have at least something going on. Mm-hmm. Otherwise everyone's bullshit detector is going off. Yeah. Uh, like <laughs> right. Yeah, and there is still a lot of bullshit in crypto and a lot of people who build really big promises and people invest a lot and they lose a lot. So another another thing to recommend is just be cautious, you know, get skin in the game, start learning, but you know, the common advice is never never invest more than you're willing to lose. Start slow. <laughs> I've lost a bunch just learning in this space, um but like I've oh, always yeah. made sure to keep oh, it yeah. less than uh, <laughs> You've learned a bunch. What's that? You paid your tuition. You're paying your tuition. I'm paying my tuition. My Yieldopolis tuition. <laughs> um, all right, cool. Well, uh, let's go into our rapid fire question round. Uh, I'm going to ask you questions. You're going to answer them as quickly as possible. You ready? Yeah. All right. Number one, what's your favorite book to give as a gift or to recommend to others? Uh, All Star Superman is a two comic series, and it's the greatest Superman story ever told by Grant Morrison. It's the ten things that Superman needs to do before he dies because uh, he realizes he has super cancer. Oh my god, that's so sad! It's like a Greek myth. It's a phenomenal book, and it has a crazy twist ending. It's like the weirdest self help book I've ever heard, but I love it. Mm. That's great. I'm gonna check it out. Uh, next one. Have you ever worn socks with sandals? Yeah, uh, in elementary or middle school, it's a uh, moved past first. It. It's yeah. Well, it's just I don't know. Um, they don't really. You're gonna get socks dirty, so don't really do that. <laughs> you don't like dirty socks. <laughs> it doesn't right. also. It doesn't look good. It you know. Does it? It's like read the room. <laughs> Society is saying something about this. So it's like this is a weird 
And like, <laughs> you know the rules break them. Like if you're Kanye and you're like, this is what people will do in three where three years. Yeah. Then hey, look it. at but Crocs, like, you know. But like, uh, most people wearing them are not Kanye. It's true. We, very true. Okay, check. Uh, what's one community engagement or conversation starter that you like to use? Engagement technique or conversation starter. Sorry. An engagement technique. What do you, like like on on social media or something or uh, well, in Yieldopolis uh, maybe like what is what's something that you like to do you know to what? kind of what create I like engagement? to do. Sometimes I will have like a thought that I just don't know how to. Like I'll have a really interesting thought, and it's completely isolated on its own, and I don't know how to talk about this. Um, mm-hmm. Or even have a conversation about it, and so I will sort of say, uh, I've noticed that people like this on Twitter or Discord. I will put my th- my complete thought that is standalone, and then I'll tell people the thought that led to me thinking that, and then I'll ask them, like, what would you think about this? Like, um, and people usually have their own version of an interesting thought that led from my initial question. Mm. So I think posing a question and answering my own question. Um, and then, po- and then like giving people the opportunity. Yeah. I think a lot of people, a lot of people like the way that they like to contribute online, uh, is by answering something. They like being, a, they like having a prompt and like seeing an example of how to answer the prompt. hundred percent. That's, that's huge. And I agree. I, I think like sharing your thought process openly is always a good engagement technique. Like we tend to only want to post a thing when we have a very clear answer already, but sharing it when you're like, I, you know, this is an interesting concept. I'm just thinking through, here's where I'm at. Like, what do you all think about it? That just invites them into this kind of great theoretical conversation. I also think uh, in real life, like I'll, I'll sort of, I'll, I'll ask someone a question sometimes, but like, if I'm lo- like, I will give an example of the kind of answer I'm looking to, for to give them a sense of like, here's how much depth I would love for exactly. you to go into on this. Yeah. And they're able to sort of mirror me on totally. that. And I can get, I don't know. It's called modeling never, in the community space. I never really space. thought about it like that, but it, it came to mind. Yeah, we call that modeling in the community space. Modeling the behavior. Uh, all right, cool. next question. How do you define happiness? Happiness is, you know, you have all sorts of cups in life that have different degrees of how full they can be. And there's like, you know, how am I as a son and a brother uh, and like people in my family, how am I doing in terms of cultivating my hobbies and interests? How am I doing on um, towards my career and finances, love, um, my health? And each of these cups, I think about like how full they are. And I don't think I can actually, I don't have enough liquid to pour into all of them. And so like, that's one way I think about like how I'm doing in towards of living an outstanding life. But in terms of happiness, I guess that's a good, like, it's also like the words I use to describe how I feel. And I try to always, I don't know. So if I'm, if I'm using positive words then I'll be happy. And if I'm using negative words, I'll be unhappy. (laughs) Yeah. I like it. I like the cup analogy too. Uh, who in the world of community would you most like to take to lunch? Who in the world of community? Uh, I think it would be really fun to go let's see. I would like to take, you know, there was, um, there's this person, I'm forgetting his name. There's this guy who has these, these like pre-planned communities around the country is, I don't know, maybe 50 or 80 of them. And they all have like 5,000 like units and they're for communities of people 55 and older or something like that. And Mm -hmm. like there's one in Palm Springs. I don't know. Uh, My parents went and visited some friends at one and they were like, this is an outstanding place. Uh, They've got like, it's like camp. They have a town hall. They have like these streets that are like full of nightlife and stuff. And it's it's like like, physical communities. It's a contained utopia type thing. Uh-huh. And I would want to go, I guess, have lunch with that guy. Uh, yeah. That sounds like a really interesting... Yeah. <laughs> we'll have to find out that guy's name. That does sound really interesting. I know. I uh, wish I had it, but... 
Well, we'll find it later. If you remember it, send it to me. We'll add it in the show notes. Um, what habit has had the most positive impact on your life? I think just um, showing up for things like bringing my passion along with me uh, on things I'm passionate about. Like if I'm passionate about something, I like activate it and like it comes through me. And I tend to only do things or get involved in things that I'm passionate about. So I tend to always have like high energy. And I think that that like the consistent feedback that I've got my entire life is like usually... I haven't met someone with like your kind of energy, Jason. Like this is really like, and and I know I have that effect on people and it comes natural to me, but like I also do it proactively at the same time, even though it comes natural. And um, that by, I think it, I think it helps me come across as a genuine, authentic person, generally very positive. And so I've, that has been so consistent across everything that I've done. Mm. Um uh, it doesn't take much energy. Like we have so much energy in the tank. Like remember that Tony Robbins event we went to, yeah. like you really, you have no excuses to not really show up and be present. And so, um, so many people don't that like you end up sort of appearing of like a much more engaged person to people yeah. because of that comparatively. And like, and I get a lot of comments on that. And so I think that must've led to a positive view of me. Yeah. In all I like that. Parts of my life. Kind of like only do things that you feel like you can bring your full energy to. It's like sometimes we like force yeah. ourselves and you know, the to do things. I've probably said no to a lot of things I don't understand, but you know, it is what it is. Well, you have to, right? And yes, Tony Robbins, we probably could do a whole episode about learnings on community from going to that Tony Robbins event. That was one of the wildest experiences I've ever had. Um, everyone, should, everyone should go to a Tony Robbins event just to feel it once. I agree. It's, like, it's, it's, it was something. What, whatever you think, we of all him. The skeptics in yeah. front of it too. And <laughs> yeah. we, we all couldn't have been more wrong. It was very vivid and interesting. Totally. Yeah, I remember going in and just being like, "I don't need this. Who are all these people? They, they, I'm, I must be better than them." And that was like day one. By day three, I was like screaming and crying and hugging and high fiving and. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. If you just like get over yourself, you know? Yeah. And like be like, well, you have to. Yeah. You come in with a lot of ego. And it, if you lean into it, you definitely have to check your ego at the door. I wrote about my Tony Robbins experience. So if anyone wants to read that, it's on Medium somewhere. Just look up my name and Tony Robbins. I'm sure you'll find it. Um, if you could only eat one food for the rest of your life, what would it be? Uh, I think it would be, I mean, one food. I, I Smoothies. I would make mm. it would be like a like a really great fruit smoothie with Greek yogurt and whey powder and athletic greens mixed in. Yeah, I mean smoothie is kind of like a, a hack to this question because you can put anything in a oh, smoothie. It's true. It's, yeah, but it's no, like it's if someone said like pizza. It. I mean, yeah. you got more specific. You said fruits, but I mean, I I broke my jaw in high school and I had to liquefy. I had burgers. I had filet mignon. Please. I had lobster. Uh, you name it. I've had it in a smoothie Gross. form. So you can you can have anything in smoothie Lob- form. Lobster smoothie. Oh my god. Well, it was lobster bisque <laughs> to be fair, but <laughs> they had to get the chunks <laughs> ground down. Um okay. Uh what's a community product you wish existed? Uh I wish, you know, there was a some sort of like in like what problem. Group chats, Discord who are all these people? Um we need like a directory of some sorts that natural that populates easy is rich with information so that people in the chat that's growing big or the discord that's growing big can have more context on who's there. Um, you can, the, there's a revealed desire of an introductions channel, uh, and like people saying, I like this info, but I don't know how to do this. Yeah. This, this strikes me as like a difficult problem to solve. Totally. The, the membership directory challenge. Yeah. Yeah. It's, no one will want to throw it out. It's also like one of those things that everyone says they want, but then when it exists, like, do you always want to be on a member? It depends on the community, right? Because you, you could end up getting spammed. Yeah. It, it's like a transactional way of seeing who's in there rather than organically meeting people. Mm-hmm. But I, I still, especially on Discord, definitely has a lot of room for improvement there. All right, just a couple more. What's the weirdest community you've ever been a part of? 
Uh, there is a Facebook group I'm in where everyone pretends to be ants. Oh yeah, and that's a great. All one. they do is post like you're, lists, in, you're in the ant community. Uh, yeah, there's two two million of us all pretending to be ants. Nice, and it's one of the funniest Facebook groups. Every nobody breaks character. <laughs> <in that group. laughs> Did you see that? There was like a TikTok that went viral recently about a girl who was just like. Like, why do all communities have to be so dramatic? And she talked about the ants community and how, like, there started to become a battle between red ants and black ants. And then, like, they, like, created a, a separate community and they went to battle Love it. over, like, which ant community was better. Who's going to, like, own the inside carpet? Yeah, it, it was the whole it. thing. It's great. Uh, great community. Everyone should check out the Ant Facebook group. <laughs> um, and last one, if you were to find yourself on your deathbed and you had to condense all of your life lessons into one Twitter-sized piece of advice, what would that advice be? I would say um, being a snob on a, a will not benefit you. And if a lot of people are excited about something, even if it's something that doesn't... If a lot of people are excited about something, you should check it out. I like it. And what I, so what I mean by that is mm -hmm. like, I think we self impose kind of uh, arbitrary notions of connoisseurship and, and high mindedness. And we'll say, ah, Tyler Perry movies aren't funny or, ah, <laughs> fast food isn't good or like that's not art. And we'll say what things are not uh, based on like that which, which we already like mm -hmm. in some sort of like judgmental view. Mm -hmm. And we end up locking ourselves out from even trying things. Like I made, I remember make the, the moment I had this idea was like, I was making fun of my cousin who loved twilight. And like, I was, um, really into Harry Potter. This was years ago. And, um, she was like a little kid and I was like, twilight stupid. <laughs> and then like, I saw like a twilight movie and I was like, that was pretty, that was pretty cool. That was, like, that was <laughs> awesome. Like, is it for me? I don't know. Like I had fun. Like who, who am I to say this wasn't for me ahead of time. Yeah. And like, I enjoyed it. And so, I then was like, wow, like the signs were everywhere. Like a lot of people were really, they were screaming about how much they love Twilight. Yeah. And then I had a similar, and then like I saw similar things like, oh, wow, look at all these people that love Pokemon Go. Fine, I'll try it out. And I've always been rewarded for trying things that lots of people really like. Yeah. Um, I've never been rewarded for not trying something. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. That's why I like huh. K-pop. That's how I like <laughs> K-pop. I, I, like, I thought it would be so stupid. And um I was like, wow, this is amazing. All right. I like that a lot. And I, that definitely resonates. In the world of community, there can be a lot of snobbishness, maybe is the word. But it's just like people have a certain idea of what community is and what it isn't. And they there's a lot of like, oh, that's not a community because X, Y, Z. But like... Uh, there's a lot of iso... Like I, I've heard this term. I might be using it wrong. But like isomorphism, where mm. people were like in a system, um, all like the sub systems gravitate towards being similar toward towards like the super mm. node in the system and so like if the new york times does journalism one way like lots of newspapers try to do journalism their way yeah. or um hey like here's a protocol in web3 they seem to have a discord and like this is what the vibe is is that what a successful community looks right. like and then everyone's like oh you got to have a discord and you got to like have a roadmap yeah. and and uh, like a lot of people are just like copying each other. Totally. Um, and it's like, are these, are these elements like really the reason why the thing was successful or were they just a symptom of a success or are they completely arbitrary and they just, totally. they're just there. And yeah. like, you know, crypto punks didn't need a discord. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the roadmap that really did it for any NFT project. Cause nobody's even executed on the roadmap. <laughs> yeah, roadmaps yet. are complete <laughs> bullshit. <laughs> And yeah, for those who don't know, CryptoPunks was around way before NFTs were like a big thing. And if you owned one at that time, you 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 owned one, right, Jason? So you're in pretty early, right? I've got yeah, I've had two of them. Uh, I think like uh, you know, people will say like, oh, CryptoPunks, like they're not open licensed. This, therefore, they're not going to be significant. Meanwhile, like everyone's discussing it, like they're being discussed. That's the point. Yeah, yeah, CryptoPunks. They're on our mind. It's kind of was one of the very first ones way before it became popular. So uh, if you own one of those from the early days, you were probably crazy at the time, but now look really smart. Again, well, that's why you should not say no to new things and 
and be open to things that other people are really excited about. Yeah, be open to putting all your money into crypto. (laughs) Not all of it. Not investment (laughs) advice. (laughs) <laughs> um, all right. Well, uh, we're at time, Jason. This is awesome. Just really grateful for you. Again, you you were there to be a landing pad for me and hold my hand through this stuff and help me wrap my head around it. And that has led me down this rabbit hole of learning a ton and, and trying to bri- be a bridge for others to learn more about Web3 in a thoughtful way. So um, I'm just really grateful for your help and your support and your friendship. And you're right. You do bring such a, a passion and energy to everything you do. I've always seen that. And and crypto and DeFi has been no difference. Um, so just appreciate all the work you're doing and, and your effort to help other people get into this space. Um, it, it's definitely had a big impact. Well, kind words. Thanks for having me on the show. If anybody found what I have to say interesting about crypto... Follow me on Twitter at Jason Hitchcock. There's also like a meeting link. And if you feel like I have office hours, you can schedule time with me and we can chat about crypto. I highly recommend doing that. <laughs> it's it's always, As you can tell, it's always fun to just riff on this stuff with you, but you'll also learn a lot and you're really good at explaining things simply in this complex world. So um, yeah, go, go follow Jason. Go book time with him. Keep learning from him. Jason, appreciate you again. And uh, thanks, everybody, for listening. We'll see you next time. 